Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins, delighted to be joined by Andrew Bolton. You're very welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, the work that you're involved in, a little bit about your journey. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Well, very happy to be here. Um, I am a, I suppose, my, my proper job and the proper way I describe myself is I'm a copywriter. Uh, I've always worked in sort of the copywriting world, various sort of agencies and sort of freelancing for brands and agencies pr pretty much all over the world. Uh, and, and a few years ago, very sort of accidentally and, and unplanned, I, I found myself teaching copywriting uh, a superb creative advertising course, the University of Lincoln creative advertising course, if I can get an early plug in. Um, and I got invited in there to, to sort of work with these sort of young ad students who are, they're learning the craft. They're, they're sort of learning what it takes to be an advertising or marketing creative, uh, everything from sort of the conceptual stuff, the big ideas, the big thinking, right through to the sort of the finished article. And, um, and it was never really on my radar to get into this world. Uh, I, I was never one of these people who felt like, you know, giving something back to the community was uh, was kind of part of, part of the plan. But I, I, I kind of got roped into it by a friend of mine who runs the course. And I loved it. I've, I've had a fantastic time. So um, the past four years have been at, at Lincoln teaching on their undergrad creative advertising program, on their postgrad creative advertising. I do a little bit with the creative writing program as well, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but I do consider myself to be a copywriter, first and foremost, uh, masquerading, honestly, <laughs> as a uh, as a teacher. That's a, that's a great introduction to the the world of Andrew Bolton. And let, let's go back a little bit, because you you've been both agency side and client side. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about the difference, a little bit about that journey? Because you've worked with some of the big brands, you've worked on some very interesting campaigns along the way. Yeah. But I'm also interested in your viewpoint in terms of the art of good copywriting, because it is, it is a very skillful, and probably in this world of AI, and I'm sure we'll get onto that, a very uh, in-demand skill. Good copywriting sometimes is hard to find out there in all the noise. And when you do find it, it makes a tremendous difference. So tell us a little bit about the agency side, the client side, and you know, maybe we'll bring it back up to uh, the University of Lincoln, where you're obviously uh, teaching this important topic and subject. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think sort of the beauty of, of sort of being able to work in kind of agency side is you get to meet the full spectrum of clients big brands smaller brands kind of startup scale-ups that, that kind of full journey of, of kind of brands as they are trying to establish themselves and trying to kind of get noticed um and and i suppose the good and bad part of that is you get to meet all the brands who really value copywriting who feel like this isn't just something that anyone can do this isn't this kind of anyone can write uh myth uh, this is about hiring sort of skilled experienced professionals who have taken the time to learn that the arrangement of the alphabet there uh, is a very difficult, very sort of complex thing if you want it to, to work well and if you want it to be kind of effective in a commercial sense and, and in, I suppose, what is kind of this brand building, sort of storytelling, relationship building, however you want to describe it, in a sense. So you meet the ones who are, are very appreciative of the fact that this, this, this sort of quite strange and niche profession exists. The other end of that sort of spectrum is that you meet a lot of brands who don't value it, who don't appreciate that the words are, I was going to say as big a part, I'm going to say the biggest part of, of kind of building and establishing any kind of brand, no matter what you sort of need to do. So uh, it, it sounds like that kind of traditional sort of stereotypical copywriter complaint about, um, you know, brands who feel like, why are we spending money on someone who, who's just arranging words for us? Anyone could do that. We can just, you know, the intern can do it for us, the account managers, as well as all the stuff they're doing already, they can write. Um, and it's real. And, and you do genuinely come across these clients who are very reluctant to be spending their money on a copywriter and they don't see the value in it. And I think even when you produce stuff that is so much better, is infinitely better than kind of what they're kind of cobbling together themselves, they still don't, you know, they're very reluctant to acknowledge that this thing is a requirement of being a good and effective and well-known and well-liked brand. Um, but also this sort of, you know, slight undercurrent of resentment that 
we're paying someone to do something that we believe, however kind of erroneously, that we can sort of do this thing ourselves. So it's always a nice reminder uh, just to kind of see that even now in, in sort of 2023, um, there are brands who don't get it. They don't get that, that kind of copywriting is important. And, you know, happily, I think some of those most reluctant or, or, or kind of agnostic clients I've met, skeptical clients I've met, we've been able to win them around. We've been able to prove why this thing is valuable, why this thing is worth, you know, your time and your investment. Um, but it's, it's in a way reassuring, I suppose, that there's a lot of brands who still haven't cottoned onto this because it feels like as long as we are required to sell ourselves and prove ourselves and, you know, finally kind of establish that, that sort of copywriting is something that is worth that investment, uh, it, it feels like we've got a job to do. It feels like we've got this kind of ongoing mission. And I suppose the mission, you, you touched upon AI, Simon, you know, the mission is evolving slightly now and it's less about, well, anyone can write to, well, the computer can write. So why do we need to sort of pay a human being to do it? So it feels like the fight goes on, but it's kind of being fought on different fronts now. Yeah, I like that a lot. And um, it's always good when I'm talking to somebody who thinks creatively from a copywriting perspective, because I was reading an article that you'd done a couple of years ago and uh, somebody was asking you questions, you know, and yeah. he got him obviously got onto the, the the topic of your daughter. And you, you were saying that your daughter was very young at the time and still is um, powered entirely by chocolate croissants and imagination yeah. and how much like dad she must be. And you also described the craft to some degree, uh, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek about thinking silly thoughts while playing with words and that. I, I love that, you know, because it was a great way. It's very different. And it cut through immediately the standard interview backwards and forwards type approach to an article, you know? I, I think that's that sense of kind of playing with words. It sounds crazy, but when we work, certainly working with the students at Lincoln, the, the biggest job you have almost is to get them to not take it too seriously. And by that, I almost mean the sense of you've come through a school system that wants you to write in particular in a certain way you conform with their expectations for what your written work and written output should be so they arrive at a, a, on a course like ours as very very much creative students destined to do kind of you know a creative career of some sorts but still their attitude to writing is very much formal serious grown up predictable and, and you've got this big job to do to say you can take this less seriously. You can do silly things. You can play around. Um, it, it's much better to kind of come back and say, I've had this really weird and, and wacky sort of thought for how I'm going to tell the story of a particular brand. And, and, and then have to kind of get them, you know, to, to think about how this works as, you know, a, a, a brief with a commercial objective than to kind of be continually coming up with this idea of, well, I have to do this in the way that's okay. I have to do this in the way that everyone has told me is okay. So uh, it, it's a weird scenario to be the teacher in a room going, be sillier, take things less seriously, play, mess around. Um, but the ones who get that and the ones who almost kind of accept that permission from you, because it's very much about permission, weirdly, at this sort of stage of, of sort of education, who accept that permission to go and do something that is sillier and wackier and quirkier and more unexpected in whatever form that takes. They're the ones who then can sort of start that journey and they leap, you know, a huge distance ahead in, in terms of becoming interesting copywriters because someone has said to them, this isn't essay writing anymore. This isn't sort of tick box GCSE stuff. This is all the stuff that's buzzing around in your head and your imagination that you're really desperate to explore. Well, now is your chance. Someone's saying it's okay to go and explore that. Yeah, and you wrote a book on this whole topic, right? Thanks. So your your book is Copywriting Is, yes. and uh, it's bright yellow, or it was at least when it was published there a little while back. And yeah. it certainly uh, it certainly grabs you from the get go. And I just love the the dust jacket or the text in the jacket because it says copywriting is easy. And then it says copywriting is hard. It's frustrating, rewarding, draining, thrilling, and in almost every way, a lot of fun, which I think is what you're describing there, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely that. And I think I, I feel a little bit like a sort of a cult leader at times when I'm talking to students. I feel like I'm in very much a brainwashing mode. And it's really hard to describe to sort of students who haven't yet experienced that kind of world that 
it's, this is an incredible way to make a living. This isn't a grown up job. This isn't like a serious, mature, sensible life. This is about silliness. This is about being able to come, out, come into an office surrounded by creative people and kind of mess around with your friends. And you're being paid to do that. There's got to be an output and the output has got to satisfy not over the, only the people internally, but also, uh, you know, the clients, of course, and ultimately then sort of the audience. But fundamentally, that's the task. That's how you kind of arrive at it, by just being a bit reckless, by being, uh, you know, unafraid to just kind of explore where these things take you. And a lot of the time they'll take you nowhere. But the, the willingness to do that and the resilience to kind of continue to do that, even when it feels like it's not going anywhere is essentially what it's all about. So I, I think out of all the pages, all the, the sort of the elements of the book that I found really difficult to write, that bit on the back where I had to actually define what copywriting is, it was really easy. Because copywriting is a lot of things that don't necessarily fit together, but all of, the, all of those things add up to a really rewarding, difficult, but really rewarding kind of creative career. Yeah, and I, I like that. And the book in itself, it's almost an accumulation of... 30 or so thoughts you know uh from all your experience that you've gathered and what you know exactly what is good copywriting and how do you how do you spot it when you see it and um i suppose you, today you're obviously teaching this subject which is as i said at the top very important but you're also still doing a little bit of creative work yourself too right yeah. so how do you stay at this sort of high level of copywriting because it, when I look at the the channels that are out there, the you know whether they're online channels or print channels or you know stuff coming at you through the airwaves and through through broadband connections, the whole world seems to be talking at the moment, and it seems to be very very noisy. So being able to cut through, being able to get your words to resonate with an end user or with an audience that actually gets them to do something, to take action on something that. That's not easy in today's world. If if anything, can I, you know, you can correct me here, but to me, it almost seems harder now than it's ever been, just through the sheer amount of volume. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a fair a fair assessment. I think there's more opportunity now to go out and sort of form a career as a copywriter, and and you know, the, what makes me say that is the amount of people who are messaging me on LinkedIn on kind of a weekly basis saying well, you've got a room full of potential new copywriters. Can we have them? You know, can you sort of send your good ones that way? So I feel like the opportunities are there, but you, you're absolutely right. This idea that uh, you're, you're kind of trying to put a message out into the world where conservatively people are pro probably kind of consuming or at least being bombarded with up to a thousand messages a day. I think some people put that estimate even higher. Uh, so you, you've kind of created this, this sort of new stage of, of kind of human evolution where the human brain is that to kind of teach itself how to tune out a lot of the things brands are saying to them whether that's out in the real world or whether that's on sort of social media there's no way you could possibly pay attention to everything you're asked to pay attention to but i think and i think most copywriters have probably sort of shared this view this, this is kind of more of an opportunity than a hindrance to copywriters because this is when you go well this is where the craft comes into it this is where the people who know their business and have worked really hard to, to kind of understand how this thing works and what makes it effective and what doesn't. So uh, while a huge amount of those messages do feel lazy and generic and deri deri uh, derivative and, and, you know, familiar, you know, feel like we've seen them a thousand times before. If you throw a good uh, uh, creative copywriter into that mix, they're going to come up with the thing that stands out. They're, their job is to come up with the thing that, say the thing that nobody else is saying. So it's hard in the fact that you are, you are adding a voice to this kind of cacophony of voices, but it's also this huge opportunity in, in that if you do something different, if you do something interesting and surprising and genuinely compelling, and I think that is the, you know, the right words to use for this, something that feels compelling, uh, you are going to elevate yourself. You are going to kind of rise to the top of this mush of, of kind of other noise. And you're going to be the thing that people go, do you know what? I've tuned out 999 things from brands today, but this one is telling me something interesting. It's telling me a story. It's entertaining me. It's making me smile in some way. And I will give my attention to that. I think however the brain has decided to, to kind of protect itself from the modern brand-driven world, the human capacity for, for curiosity is never going to change. It's never going to go away. And if a copywriter appeals to that curiosity, then you win. 
when I when I think about copywriting, and I'm immediately drawn back uh, to you know the advertising sort of heydays, the Madison Avenue type stuff, and I'm thinking of David Ogilvy, and I'm thinking of Leo Burnett, and all those kind of people that really poured a lot into their craft, I suppose. Uh, again, a different time, a different era, you know. Um, predominantly print radio and TV were the primary channels then. Uh, there wasn't really the internet that we know today or any of the social media uh, taking place. But good copywriting still had to shine through in order to, in a lot of cases back then, shift product. Um, and what what got you into copywriting in the first place? How did you end up you know, as this creative copywriter, lecturing on copywriting and also, you know, putting a book together on it. Where did this passion come from? Because it must have been something you've been interested in for a long time. I think it's it's the answer I'll, I'll give is probably the answer. Sadly, you, you'll get from a lot of kind of the, the sort of good copywriters knocking around at the moment. I stumbled into it. I, I kind of went through school very much knowing that writing was something I love to do and, and found very rewarding and, and dreamed uh, that, that I could turn it into a, a sort of a grown-up life. But when you're at school it, uh, and that's kind of what you're leaning towards, the advice you're given, and it, this is no fault of sort of the, sort of the teachers or uh, uh, sort of the schools that, that we were going through at the time, would be, well, you like writing, so you could go into journalism, but I need to warn you that journalism is hard and harsh and poorly paid and long hours and, you know, can grind you down. Or you can write a novel, which is unlikely to ever get published and is also hard and harsh and, you know, likely to grind you down. Um, or, you know, what we recommend is we'll send you off to university and you can go and study English literature and you're not doing anything, you know, creative writing of your own. You are, uh, you're consuming creative writing that people have written 10, 20 or usually 100 years ago. So it feels like a dead end. So you feel like you're this 17, 18 year old who's got a very clear idea of, of what they like and what they're into and what they feel they're good at or could be good at. And you feel like you've hit a, a, a dead end very, very early. Uh, so I sort of went away with this sort of thing in my head about I really want to get into writing, but I'm not going to be a journalist. And I'm not going to write a novel. So I'm probably going to go into some kind of more uh, respectable kind of line of work. And then I just happened to bumble into it. I, I, I took a punt and I searched on an online job site, just the word writer. And it means, uh, uh, you know, amongst all the kind of the bid writers and tender writers and, you know, all the things that you will find. I found a job for a copywriter at um, Egg, I don't know if you remember Egg, the credit card company, sadly now defunct, and they were looking for a copywriter to come in and do a lot of their sort of brand comms and, and, and all sorts of different things. So I applied for that and I went in and I was honest, I've never been copywriting, I discovered what copywriting is, you know, a matter of days ago, um, but you know, would you give me a chance? And, and I met some really cool people who were, uh, who were willing to do that and sort of take a chance on someone who didn't have you know, the specific experience they're looking for, but obviously had a, a love of an appreciation of words and what they can do. Um, without that moment in time, my life takes a very, very sort of different direction. So in a way, super grateful that I happened, happened to kind of go down that path completely by accident. But also it's a very sad thought. There are loads of people like me, not just in, at that moment in time, but, you know, even now, who are feeling exactly the same things. I want to be a writer. I love writing. What is the grown-up job I can do or semi-grown-up job I can do where I put my writing to use and that's the thing that becomes my most valuable asset. And they never find it. They don't hear about it. And, you know, maybe 10 years down the line after, you know, training to be a mortgage advisor or whatever, uh, you discover it then and you feel like your moment has passed in a way. So uh, I, I think if you could give me kind of one wish, in the world it would be it's a very selfish squandering of a wish it would be that we we much more visible early on for these kind of young creative writers there is this job this job is fun and rewarding it's also very prevalent it's probably one of the most viable opportunities for you to go and get work as a writer and just to spread that word a little bit more yeah and you 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 took me back a little bit to the the days of egg and for people maybe listening around the world that may not be familiar with that brand, but that was a huge investment in the UK that that brand and that company grew significantly and they had a very unique way of telling that story. Um, so that, that, that was good, but I didn't realize that you went in and went, look, I, I I'll give it a go. Uh, it's amazing how things happen, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it was a time, certainly with Egg, where every other bank was doing serious adult banking things. And Egg were like, no, our advert's going to have guinea pigs in it. And at the time, that probably, you know, now, looking back, it doesn't feel like radical in, in sort of today's It market. was then, yeah. It was very, very different. And it stood out an awful lot. Yeah, completely. So, I mean, I, I'm very, very sort of grateful for that. But by, by a whisker, I, I sort of got myself into this world. Very good. And it reminds me, I, I, I'm sure you've read, or a lot of people have read uh, Rory Sutherland's book, Alchemy, where he talks about this mind-numbing conformity and you know you just reference banks there and all the bank collateral all the bank materials all the banking ads all felt the same at that period in time mm -hmm. and to come out with some original thinking some creative writing some creative differences it really helped a, a challenger brand in inverted commas stand out from the pack so i think that in itself is a great example of the power of words because they're the same words but the order you put them in and what they mean uh it's completely different you know yeah, completely and i i think it, you've almost kind of that's evolved slightly even from, from those days where a brand could enter a sector that that always behaved in very very sort of traditional established ways and disrupt it what that kind of born brands like egg were, was a lot of brands who came in and said we're going to sort of do disruptive and, and unexpected and quirky things it's almost like the sort of the innocentification you know, I, I remember working in an agency where every single brand that we worked with came to us and said, we want to sound like Innocent because they were doing stuff that was so sort of uh, new and fresh. So you will end up with a lot of the challenger brands who almost established their new set of norms and all the challenger brands are doing things that are the same as the others. So then you end up with the challenger challengers and it, it kind of add in for nine from there. And, um, but this, this kind of recognition that just because things are done a certain way doesn't mean that's the only way things can be done, as long as that kind of exists in the brand world. And I don't see any reason why it will ever cease to exist. I and mean, even looking at kind of Oatly and the way sort of Oatly established themselves in the market. Um, yeah. I think it comes that. back to, Andrew, doesn't it, what you were saying earlier, though, with allowing yourself that freedom to sort of go outside of that box that's been, you know, firmly drawn yeah. allowing yourself that creative almost silliness sometimes to really think differently and just to bend the thinking a little bit into different areas i think that's where you end up isn't it yeah completely uh, it's, it's those kind of two words what if you know uh, and, and i think you mentioned rory sutherland's sort of alchemy which is along with sort of hey whipple is it's kind of a close to a bible as, as you can have on a course like that someone who is established and successful in that world telling you that the only way to actually do anything meaningful in sort of that space is to be different and to think different and and to not worry about being the only one who was taking a certain path i think there's this feeling of unless you are conforming at least on some level you're doing it wrong and if we can deprogram that not just in students but but even in sort of the successful agencies out there then straight away a lot of advertising and marketing and sort of brand communication stuff starts to get more interesting starts to get more compelling so while i have you here i have to go back to the ai discussion okay and i'm sure you've had many discussions on this already yes. but uh i was talking to people recently and if you'd have told me five years ago that there would be a job today that's paid and advertised for which is a chat gpt prompt writer and we're hiring, we're hiring prompt engineers, chat GPT engineers that can come in and write prompts to scope the AI engines to actually output the words in the right way that we need. I just said, what are you talking about five years ago? But today, people are hiring these prompt writers, these word engineers to work with AI. Now, on the other side of that, you've got people saying, well, if you use all this AI output content, it ultimately the world's going to get flooded with this AI content. It's all going to become bland and the same. And there's a whole copyright and, you know, court thing working its way through when it comes to mid journey and imagery and all that good stuff. Um, and then you've got a lot of brands saying, we don't want to go anywhere near this yet. We're going to stick to what we know works. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, some companies are really valuing now. And as you say, probably while you're getting the calls, I need to hire really good creative writing copywriters because this is where my business is at. Um, but then you're going to also have a lot of businesses that just go down this AI writing route. 
So what are your thoughts on it? I'm very interested as somebody who teaches on the subject of copywriting and creative writing. Where are you at with this whole AI debate, Andrew? I feel like I, I'm not ready, and this might be pure ignorance, I'm not ready to kind of consider it a threat. And I know a lot of people are sort of starting to sort of uh, flag those early warning signs that this is the thing that, that could change everything. This is the thing that could undo it all. Um, and I, I don't feel like it is a threat purely because, and again, very much, you know, a deliberately ignorant understanding of the tech and how it all, all works. I think AI is kind of, uh, it can produce writing, it can produce certain types of content, but it, it's cannibalizing what's already out there. It's kind of feeding on what exists. And the way I've always understood copywriting to be and the way I've already, uh, I've always taught it is that this isn't about uh, regurgitating what is already there or what's already been done, it's finding the new stuff. Uh, and I think you, you've almost got this kind of infinite resource of imagination. I don't think imagination is ever gonna run out. I don't think it's ever gonna kind of get to the point where we can't tap it or we can't, um, we can't kind of draw on it anymore for new thoughts and new ideas. So that doesn't feel like an AI job to me. That feels like a person job. That feels like a creative human being job where you look at the world and go, I'm gonna see this stuff, this particular issue or this particular topic in a way that no one's ever thought about it before. And there's nothing that you could type into an AI that says, give me something completely new. You know, you know transform the way, I, the way we think about a certain thing. And good copywriting and good sort of creative advertising can still do that. It can still say, here is this completely original expression of something. You know, it could be a product or a brand we've been talking about for 60 years, but a human copywriter can go, well, here's a way we've never spoken about it. Here's a way we've never thought about it. So I, I, I it's not necessarily that I'm skeptical and there, there, there probably is gonna emerge a role for, for sort of AI in some form, in some kind of level of brand communication. I am worried that it, it might kind of shunt out those kind of early opportunities for junior writers because sometimes as a junior writer the way you get into this industry is by going in and, and sort of working on kind of the content farms and kind of producing the I don't want to say the the churn stuff but the, the kind of the business as usual the everyday stuff and there is a danger that AI starts to swallow that some up some of that stuff up and you take away a very important step for junior writers to kind of learn their craft in a professional environment um but is it going to replace imaginative, original, strange, peculiar, creative thought? I don't think it will. I don't think it can. In the same way that we're not all going to stop reading novels by human beings simply because there's a computer program that can produce a novel. I think it's, it's we need probably a little bit more faith in what we do and what makes that unique before we start panicking too severely. Yeah, that's a great answer. And um I think there's, you know, the third way possibly is that it becomes an enabler for good copywriters to pull basic frameworks and basic information together, but it, it still needs that human yeah. uh, expertise on top. Yeah, fully agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I do appreciate it. And look, I want to change gear a little bit because I want to ask you a few other questions as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you is that when you onboard information yourself, obviously uh, the love of, you know, the love and passion of words is, is very apparent. But are you an avid reader with everything that you've got going on? Do you have time to pick up the book? And if so, what's the genre? What, what do you like to read? Do you read for business? Do you read for pleasure? Do you read for, you know, expanding your thinking on a particular topic? How does that work for you? Are you an audio book person? Do you love podcasts? Do you hate podcasts? Or at the end of the day, after a busy day lecturing at the university, you just need to put on Netflix. How does it all work for Andrew? It's kind of all of the above, what you've just said. I feel like um, Audible has been a bit of a revelation for me. Uh, and I think certainly since we had our daughter, the time that would usually be pick up a book, sit and read, I can probably get through half a page of a book and then I'm, I'm sort of fast asleep. So she, she sort of ruined that for me in a way, which I tell her all the time. So that's fine. Um, so, you know, access to Audible and sort of the audiobook world has, has been transformative because I've got a long commute driving from Nottingham to sort of Lincoln Uni, three hours in a car every day, which is sad and frustrating and it's sort of time away from home and the family. But the upside is that's three hours of book time. That's three hours of consuming, a, you know, a hopefully an interesting and, and engaging read. So. I'm all for that. I, I do wrestle a little bit, you know, when people say, have you read a certain book? 
and I've listened to it on Audible, I feel a little bit uncomfortable going, yeah, I've, I've read it, I've read it. Um, but that's, you know, uh, that's my sort of inherent snobbery. And, and I think um, it is a completely legitimate way to kind of consume this stuff. I, I read anything that feels like it would be interesting and entertaining. I think the beauty of being a copywriter is every book is a business book. Every book is contributing to sort of the professional output. I'm reading something at the moment. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, here we go. And it's called uh, Dear Committee Members by uh, Julie Schumacher. And it's uh, a series of letters from this kind of fictional professor of English and creative writing, where they are increasingly sort of frustrated with the world of academia, which I can definitely sort of relate to. And it's funny and it's, it's scathing and it's beautifully crafted. And so there's so many sentences that I've just, you know, scribbled a uh, pencil circle over. And I think it's that, it's almost this kind of a compulsive collection of brilliant sentences, which is, is kind of the curse of being a copywriter, but it's also this, this sort of beautiful thing where you're always learning about what can we do with words? What sort of kind of power can we, we kind of communicate sort of through these things? So I, I don't I don't like to sort of prescribe rules and laws for being a copywriter because I think it's a very sort of scruffy and, and individual profession. But I honestly don't know how you can do it and do it well without being a reader. I love that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, what about throughout your life? You must have people that have inspired you, people that you admire, people that you look up to, or just people who maybe give you a helping hand along the way. When I ask you that kind of question, is there any particular type of person or individuals that spring to mind? I think I've, I've been really lucky with sort of people I've, I've met in my career um, and, and uh, various kind of uh, uh, se senior creatives, more senior than me, who I've kind of worked with. And I suppose the biggest sort of thing I, I'm probably kind of grateful for from them is uh, even as kind of a creative heading into a creative world, when you're a young person, you're going into your first ever professional job, you feel like you have to behave in a certain way and you feel like you have to be in the right place at the right time and visibly working and visibly kind of producing output. And certainly when I went to Egg, and I was like, right, I've got to sit at my desk and be at my desk and be typing all the time. Otherwise, people are going to think, why they, why they hired this? Uh, like inexperienced child to come and join our team and what I learned very quickly at Egg because of the people who were around me was this is creative stuff if you need to go and walk if you need to go and sit in a coffee shop if you need to go and lie down on the floor for an hour straight just staring at the ceiling as long as you come back with something good as long as you come back with a good line or a good idea we don't care how you do it we don't care how you arrive at that and that for me was game changing that was sort of life altering that that kind of realization because i don't think my my brain works in a grown up way it doesn't work in the sort of you know obeying sort of the rules of the office kind of way i i i think i'm a hard worker and i think i you know i produce the stuff that i'm being paid to do but i don't do it in a way that feels conventional i i like to wander around i like to be invisible for a little bit i like to go and sit in the pub Let's go and sit in the pub and just think and sort of scribble things down in a notebook. So to kind of, you know, get that permission from these more experienced senior creatives who have been there and they've done it and they've lived it their whole lives, who can say, this is all right, it's okay for you to go and do this. So this is something I say to our students all the time. Some of them who are brilliant creatives and they've got big sort of futures, they're always in the same place. I know exactly where they'll be. They'll be at their desks and they'll be working on the same notepad and, and sort of performing and, and processing it all in the same way. And I say to them, just, you know, vary this up. You know, you've got permission. You're, you've chosen a life and a career where nobody cares how you do it as long as you do it and you do it really well. So I, I think I've been really lucky to have a, a long string of figures in my career who have endorsed that and supported that. And, and that's been something that stayed with me. And I feel now it's almost my kind of duty to, to pass that on to the students and let them know that whatever it takes for you to arrive at the great line, the great idea, the great campaign, do it in your own way. Nobody cares, you know, what you did to get there. They just care about what that end product is. You know, I really like that, Andrew. I think that's that's really important. And I'm so glad that you raised that because it was almost for yourself. It sounds as though somebody almost gave you the permission. You suddenly went, oh, I can do that. You know, it was almost yeah. as though you weren't sure or nobody had actually just addressed that. And you went, well, of course I can do that. I'm a creative, you know. Yeah. Um, 
But also, uh, when I think about the future of work and the way that we work, even outside of the creative field, you know, if you'd have told me that the vast majority of people wouldn't be going to an office for a few years because they were just closed down, I just said, what are you, what are you talking about? That that doesn't sound, what? Uh, but the world sort of kept turning and some businesses did really well. I know some suffered, some suffered terrible. And, you know, I'm not saying a pandemic's a good thing, but I suppose one of the silver linings was that, people did start to think about doing business differently. People did start to think about working differently. And I think particularly in the creative field, I think that uh, I'm not going to use the word permission again, but that way of understanding that it's almost, it's the output that we're interested in. How you come to it is quite individual, isn't it? Yeah, completely. And I, I think silver linings is the perfect way to describe it because, you know, um, I, pre-pandemic, sort of pandemic, my agency life, you were told by, by agency owners. But what I do think, this might be slightly unfair, but I do think some have a, 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 an inherent mistrust of creatives and they feel like they're going to swindle them out there, you know, the salaries somehow. Um, but we were told that this, this job can't be done remotely. This can't be done with people working at home. This can't be done, you know, unless everyone is in the same building at the same time for the same duration, uh, pointing in the same direction. So it was never an option. It was never something that would be considered. You, you, would, you would certainly get a black mark against your name if you came forward and said, well, I want to go and work at home. I want to work at home today. I've got thinking to do. Can I go and do it you know, somewhere else? Uh, wandering about and, and, and sort of going to a coffee shop for a couple of hours was one thing, but saying I'm going to be remote from the office was, was you know, unheard of and certainly wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be sanctioned. And then their hands got forced. And I think this thing that they had been resisting all the time suddenly got kind of taken out of their out of their gift. Uh, and we all got to experience it. And the penny drops that, oh, actually, this thing does work perfectly well. Um, I don't think I would ever want to work in an agency world where you were never in the building, where you were never sort of surrounded by your sort of fellow creatives and, and sort of the people you work with. Uh, but equally, um a uh, agency life does not have to kind of exist in this sort of, sort of same square brick square at the same times with the same people every single day monday to friday uh because wherever your imagination functions best you're doing work you're producing something so it, it was a bit of a blessing in a way for a lot of people who had always been sort of handcuffed to their agency building not through choice but through sort of the dictates of their um of the agency owners so we can be grateful for that, if nothing else, from from sort of the COVID years. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think particularly for creative type work, um, it's very different to say physical labour because the amount of thinking, reflecting, considering that needs to take place. Um, if you're stuck in the same place all the time with the same people all the time, that doesn't help. Um, oh, quite so the I, yeah, yeah. Um, well, listen, thanks. That's a great answer. I really like that, Andrew. And the other thing I want to ask you as well before we run out of time today is when you look forward over the next six, 12 months, what's on the horizon for you? You've obviously got this, this talent pool of, of people that you're working with. You're inspiring them when it comes to their own creative writing and their own copywriting skills and abilities. I'm sure you keep abreast and you know uh can't resist the odd little brief that may come across your desk from time to time but what does the next six to 12 months look like for you what are you focused on i suppose sort of the immediate immediate focus is we've got um we've got an incredible group of, of sort of third years at the moment and they are the generation who spent their first year pretty much fully well not even fully kind of learning online but also padlocked into their university accommodation and I think if you could expect any generation of kind of creative student to be floundering or certainly to kind of be behind where they should be, it should be this year. And the opposite has happened. We, we were looking at this third year now who are incredibly talented, incredibly sort of interesting and, and sort of imaginative, creatively producing some really brilliant, really mature, really effective kind of work. So uh, I think, you know, the fact that they've turned around what could have been a really disappointing and, and, and underwhelming university experience into you know the, the stage that they're at now is just exciting I think you look at it and you almost kind of can't believe where they've got to based on where they started 
So we are uh, we are shipping them out into the world in the next kind of few months, and they are working hard on things like DNA D submission and, and building a portfolio, and actually going out and meeting kind of agencies and, and kind of creative directors at the moment. So they feel like very much kind of the priority. We've got a talented bunch of MA students uh, in the second year of our, our kind of creative advertising MA at the University of Lincoln, who again you look at them and you feel like I can see you in agencies. I can see you in that world, you know, doing interesting things and, and being liked and, and relied upon and, and kind of brought into these big and exciting briefs. And there is this sort of sad, vicarious thrill you get when, you know, you look at these young people sort of starting out in the world when you know that they've got it, when you know that they've got the thing that is going to enable them to not only do well, but to do well in a career where they're going to have so much fun. Um, so I'm, I'm, horribly jealous horribly sort of envious of kind of what's ahead of them but also really really proud of kind of what they've been able to do just purely by the resilience to say well okay unusual first year unusual set of circumstances but you know that's not going to stop us that's wonderful and listen i, I really appreciate the work that you're doing there and the uh you know <laughs> long may long may continue andrew because we definitely need the the new blood coming through we need that inspiration when it comes to the creative word and you know producing world-class copywriters i think is probably more important now than it's ever been um fully agree. absolutely yeah. uh last thing i want to ask you is is there anything that i haven't asked you or is there any other area that you'd like to touch on and also if people want to find out more get in touch figure out more about what you're doing in terms of the lecturing or maybe find out more about the book where's the best place to send people to i will send you off to uh, the gasp uh, website so gasp are my publisher an amazing publisher have been incredibly supportive and they published my uh, copywriting book copywriting is and they published uh, a children's book i wrote about copywriting called adele writes an ad uh, you can find all that there at gasp i think gasp.com um if you want Want to find me if you want to ask me anything about sort of the the sort of the creative advertising lecturing world or sort of you know how you get into copywriting or train to be a copywriter i'm on linkedin linkedin is, is my uh my social media drug of choice and you will find me on there doing silly things well look that's a great place for us to finish this discussion today andrew it's been a pleasure to catch up with you thanks for taking us on this wonderful tour of creative writing and uh, the importance of copywriting i really enjoyed our discussion today uh, so thank you thank you andrew thanks to everybody who's watching or listening to this episode around the world i certainly appreciate that if you can like follow subscribe do all the things i need you to do to help support the podcast that would be appreciated and i hope you'll join me back here for some more discussions with creatives leaders and thinkers so thank you andrew it's been great to talk to you today pleasure thanks for having me